All right, hi everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. This is the Return to School Support Town Hall from Children's Hospital New Orleans. As many of you are aware, this is in partnership with the Louisiana Department of Education. My name is Kimberly Buckingham and I am the School Wellness Practice Administrator here at Children's Hospital New Orleans and I'll be the moderator during our town hall today. As usual, we'll start with an update on COVID-19 here in Louisiana and then we'll dive into a conversation around scenario review and how that pertains to a COVID-19 decision tree that we've put together for schools in partnership with the Department of Health. We'll also open it up to several Q&A opportunities for those participating. Just a reminder, this series um, with the, um, our town hall series will take place throughout the month of September starting every other Tuesday from 3 to 4 p.m. Our topics that we'll cover will vary depending on uh, what schools are experiencing throughout the reopening process. These recordings will be posted to uh, both, excuse me, sorry, these postings will be, uh, these recordings will be posted to the Louisiana Believes YouTube channel as well as the school wellness website. So we encourage you to visit recordings at those locations. And as a reminder to the resources that are available to you, um, the Louisiana Department of Education has reopening guidance and resources at their website. The most recent uh, version of those guidelines were updated yesterday, August 31st, and are available at that link. Additionally, if there are any questions or concerns, you can submit those at any time to LDOE COVID-19 support at la.gov. And uh, answers to those questions will be incorporated into the dynamic FAQ document that is a living document available um, for schools to reference. This Thursday, the LDOE will also be hosting another reopening office hours from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, available through the Zoom information that's posted here. And here at Children's Hospital New Orleans, we continue to have our school wellness and virtual care hotline as well as our online resources. Please feel free to reach out to these resources at any time when needed. At the hotline, schools can reference COVID-19 medical guidance related to a single individual. If there's any concerns around reporting positive cases or determining close contacts, we are working closely with the Office of Public Health um, to uh, direct you in the right direction for that. Uh, we also have return to school screening, at-home symptom monitoring, and virtual visits with a physician available through that hotline. And uh, we encourage everyone to explore our school wellness website page uh, for recordings, downloadable materials, FAQ, virtual care, and other guidance resources for parents, schools, and students. So starting with our update on COVID-19 in Louisiana, first want to introduce Mr. Ken Bradford um, from the Department of Education. Thank you, Ken, for making time to be here with us today. I'll open up the floor for you before we, Dr. Finger begins with the COVID-19 update. Hey, thank you. I just I was having some technical glitches. Looks like I, I hopped in just in time. Um, yep. Once again, uh, just want to, you know, take time to, to thank you all for, for supporting us through, during these, you know, extremely challenging times right now, given Hurricane Laura and, and the COVID and the, and the school reopening. So just want to, um, you know, state our, 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 our appreciation for everything that you all are doing. And I know that our school systems, they look forward to these calls every week because they know they can come here and get you know clear answers to, to questions that they've been having so again thank you and I, I won't take much of your time because um, you're all the important folks today on the call and uh, look forward to the discussion thank you and we really appreciate your partnership and appreciate uh, you taking a minute to, to talk today all right, Dr. Finger, our Chief Quality Officer here at Children's Hospital New Orleans. Uh, he leads our COVID-19 response for the organization and is a pediatric intensivist by training. He also oversees our organization's patient and team member safety protocols and leads a team of infection prevention specialists. So I will let Dr. Finger go ahead and start with an update on COVID-19 here in Louisiana. Thank you, Kimberly. You know, before I start, I think it's reasonable to pause as an education community and send our, you know, thoughts and prayers to the folks in the state of Louisiana who've been affected by the storms of the last week. I was here in New Orleans 15 years ago when Katrina struck and was overwhelmed with the support that the entire state of Louisiana gave to me, our patients here in New Orleans, and the entire community. So I hope the folks on the phone, if you 
have been personally affected, your schools have been affected, or your loved ones, you feel the support from the entire state. Thank you for allowing me to say that, Kimberly. Um, a quick update on COVID-19 status in the state of Louisiana. As of uh, this morning, we have just over 149,000 positive cases. The rate of increase over the last seven to 10 days has continued to decline throughout the entire state and all nine regions in the state of Louisiana. And just under 9% of those patients are less than the age of 18 years. We are diagnosing relatively more overall positive kids, but the percent positive in that age, but age groups less than 17 years of age continues to decline uh, each week since it peaked in July. So that's really, really good news. Our overall percent positivity rate across the entire state has remained under 10% over the past two weeks, and some regions are actually much lower than that. So continuing to improve. Um, the golden rules that we've seen, sort of following the rules and recommendations from the governor, as well as the um, start, Strong Starts um, 2020 from the Louisiana Department of Education. I'll start actually with number four on here, stay home if you're sick. I can't tell you how many cases we've seen that might have been prevented had the individual um, team member in their place of work just stayed home when they felt mild symptoms. It, this is gonna be important as you engage with your parents, your families, as well as your team members that it's okay and we want you to let us know when you're not feeling well. Um, that way we can make sure we take care of that team member, our students and their families, as well as keeping the campus safe. Addition, all the measures that you have undertaken planning for in the last several months, including how you operationalize things, won't work if we can't abide by washing our hands, wearing those masks, and socially distancing when you can. Those things are integral to eliminating the spread of this disease on your school campuses. Um, again, these are, these are things that if you can abide by them, uh, there will be minimal uh, spread of the disease on the school campuses. The, the times that we have seen thus far recognizing that it's very recent that we've returned to in-person learning for um, transmission amongst school-age kids has by and large been amongst teenagers when they are congregating in off-campus activities not on the grounds of the school campus. So I think that's important for you guys to know. We can only do as much as we can do and we can't control everything that happens outside of our view or outside of our campuses. So um, I know different school, uh, school districts and principals have dealt with that in different ways in trying to engage with parents, but really what happens outside of schools is gonna absolutely tremendously impact what happens on your school grounds. So keeping engaged with your communities, the kids and the parents is gonna be instrumental to successful reopening for in-person education. So that's sort of my opening spiel. As we go through, I did wanna highlight a little bit about masks and what an appropriate mask is. I, out of the 100 questions we get today, probably 50% of them relate to masks. At this point in time, um, cloth masks are more strongly recommended than gaiters. Um, the CDC has not explicitly stated that you cannot wear gaiters. However, I wouldn't be surprised if at some time this fall they come out with that recommendation. So for that reason, the recommendation is as follows. We strongly recommend wearing cloth masks as opposed to another type of mask, including gaiters. That being said, I think the local leadership at each school needs to address how they'll address, how they'll address students who want to wear gaiters. I think what we have found here in the local New Orleans community is one-to-one -one conversations really help with the education about why that's the case and haven't seen a ton of pushback when you can have that direct dialogue. So that's the language that we're using. The other question we've seen a lot is what to do with physical education. Recently, the governor um, in the state of Louisiana had a mandate that wearing, about wearing a mask in public and with the um, corollary that PE is a public setting. That being said, the LHSAA guidelines include a clause stating 
if you are uncomfortable when doing aerobic exercise, it's okay to remove the mask. We believe as well, I believe as well as the state medical director from the Office of Public Health, that if a child is outside and you can adequately social distance when you're doing an athletic endeavor, it's okay to remove the mask for a period of time. It's hard to say that in a um, sort of always do this or never do that because each case will be somewhat individualized and I don't want individual school members to overinterpret. But again, if, if kids are outside and the, ed and the educators are outside and everyone can adequately social distance, it it's gonna be okay to remove the mask when kids need a break. So Kimberly, I think we can pause there and maybe go on to the next slide. Sure, we actually have a quick question that came in about gaiters, Dr. Finger. Is the issue with gaiters the material or is it the actual shape? It's the, it's the uh, material, the quality of the material is actually somewhat thinner and potentially more disruptive to aerosols than the cloth mask. Thanks for the question. All right, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time taking the team members on the phone through the screening decision tree. We've heard a lot of questions and I've described this conceptually, but I don't think we've gone through this on one of these town halls. So we have two decision trees. Number one, what to do if there's a child or a team member who's symptomatic while on the school grounds. And the next decision tree, which we'll get to in a few minutes about what to do when you have a positive case and you suspect close contacts. So if there is someone, either a child or a team member who's experiencing COVID-like symptoms, the real urgency or most immediate thing you need to do is remove that student or team member from exposure to anyone else on your campus. And that involves the isolation room that you guys have already established a location for on your school campuses, okay? We have the list of COVID-19 symptoms, but those of you who have um, spoke with me directly or seen anything on the news, it really could be anything. Now, that being said, there's plenty of people who have asthma who might have an asthma flare and might have a little bit of shortness of breath and wheezing that it won't be COVID-19. But it, it is going to be, as we return to in-person learning, sometimes challenging to sort that out. That being said, for any of these symptoms that we list here, uh, we're asking that people get isolated and leave campus as quickly as they can um, and that the local designated representative for that school notify the regional medical director. As I've learned over the past several weeks, almost every school system has a mechanism that routes that to your local regional medical director. And we say notify as opposed to call or email because I think each regional medical director has a different way that they want their local school system to notify them. At that point in time, um, you know, the child or team member will have gone home and they can um, seek care with a, their primary care provider who might consider a COVID-19 test. Let's follow the right-hand side of the algorithm. If they perform a test and it's negative, then that student or team member stays home essentially until symptoms improve and they've been fever free for 24 hours, which is essentially what we do for all sort of viral crud in schools and you've done that historically before 2020. If we follow the left-hand side of the algorithm and there's a positive test um, or they elect that no test needs to be performed, that student or team member stays in isolation for a period of time of 10 days since the first symptom appeared and symptoms have improved and they've been fever free with no medications for over 24 hours. And again, if there's a positive test that's done at that point, we'll notify close contacts. After that period of time, the student or team member can return to school with documentation as required for the school policy. The Louisiana Department of Health has a um, form titled Return to School Cert Self-Certification, how schools might ask for some self-documentation. There does not need to be another visit to a provider to sign off on this unless a school makes that decision to do that. But I think that will be overwhelming and not necessarily that helpful. Um, 
again, the first call should go to the regional medical director in your region when you have those cases. I'm gonna go through the next algorithm and then perhaps we can take questions. Kimberly, go ahead. All right, so a close contact is established after there's a positive COVID-19 case on the school campus. So what that means is, and again, the school representatives are not gonna be responsible for making that determination in isolation, i.e. without talking with the team from your regional medical director's office. So I'll, give a, I'll take you through this and then go through a couple of examples. If someone is identified to be a close contact, they will be instructed to quarantine for a period of 14 days. If they, develop, if they don't develop any symptoms during that quarantine, they do not necessarily need to be tested. The test capacity throughout much of the state is variable, and there's probably not capacity to test every asymptomatic close contact at this time. If over those two week, that two week period, there's no symptoms that develop, they can return to school with documentation per the school policy after the 14 days. If the close contact develops symptoms during that two week period, then you flip over and revert to the symptomatic decision tree and the recommendation would be for that student or team member to get tested and follow the decision tree. Regardless of the test, whether it's positive or negative, that, that student or team member will still have to remain in quarantine for the entire two week period. So even if that close contact has a negative test at day seven, they still have to remain in quarantine for the entire two weeks. A couple of things that the regional medical directors wanted to make sure I highlighted here was that it can be challenging if there is an adult or another child in the house who's positive, and that's what causes someone to be a close contact. So the student will be out for two weeks, not necessarily due to a case that is uh, on your school campus, but because of a community cont contact. I'll use me and my family as an example. I'm married and I have three daughters. On Monday, I have symptoms of COVID-19 and I get tested and my test result comes back as positive. My job is to isolate and that means including isolation from my family members. If I can effectively do that in my house, which means no contact and I have my own designated bathroom, my family's quarantine period starts on Tuesday. If I cannot effectively do that, and the regional medical directors will make this recommendation, then I have to go through my entire isolation period, which might be 10 days at the shortest. Let's say my symptoms get better, I don't have a fever. Next Thursday, my 10-day isolation period ends. That's when the two-week period of quarantining for my wife and three daughters would begin. So there's obviously no way for a regional medical director's team to effectively police every family in the state of Louisiana, but that's the recommendation that they're giving over the phone and that we'll be in charge of conveying potentially to families. So some medical directors, not just in the state of Louisiana, but around the whole country have called this the 10 plus 14 days. If you cannot effectively say, yes, I can isolate from the rest of my family during this time. So I know it's confusing, but they asked me to make sure I stress that again, no one's going to be going to homes to police this. So I think we have to take people for their word. And if they say that they can effectively isolate, you can revert back to the starting the two week countdown on day one. But I think that's a conversation that I know a lot of people are going to have at periods of time. I've had it a ton already over the last five months. So I'll pause there, Kimberly, because typically there are a lot of questions about this. Um, and that, let's see if I can answer some of those questions before I get into sort of my second part of this discussion. Sure, so a handful of scenario questions have come up. Uh, one just involves social distancing, uh, specifically for uh, agris teachers that are doing things like welding and building small engines after schools with students. Oftentimes those activities require working closely with team members. How would you advise that type of team member um, take the precautions of social distancing? 
Yeah, so it's a great question. I think anything you can do to, if the students themselves can be spaced during that class um, is gonna be great. And making the contact as brief as possible while still making sure you, you maintain the integrity of the classroom instruction. Okay, thank you. Now getting back to certain scenarios that might apply to these charts that you just reviewed. Say there was a student who had a fever and sees a physician, but that physician advises the student that they can return to school without getting a COVID-19 test. What yep, would you why do? Yep, why don't you yep, go back to the previous, uh, previous chart? We are allowing with, so with that, we are allowing with a doctor's note for that, that child to return. And I know there's some, I'm just seeing the names on this list of participants. There are some people who have already addressed cases like that. And I think that's okay. I think local providers will know the prevalence within their communities. And we've allowed that, we've allowed that documentation from a provider's note um, to be okay. Okay. So an another situation with a student involving symptoms, say a fever, if they are advised to leave school uh, without a test confirmation yet, do you inform other parents that that student had been in close contact with their children? Not at this time. And this is why it's going to be so important to notify your local regional medical director. I will say they will have the ability and they have the authority to say, hey, even though we don't, you know, A, even though we don't have a COVID-19 test done at this time, let's treat this as a presumptive positive because of X, Y, and Z, i.e., if, if it's a third grader and both of the third graders' parents have COVID-19 and the prevalence rate in the local community is 25%, they might say, hey, we're going to err on the side of caution. We know what's happening on the ground in City X. We're going to treat this as a COVID-19, even if we don't have a positive, and proceed and sort of interface with the school community as, like that. Does that make sense, Kimberly? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. Uh, we had another question come in that was a really good one. Uh, say a school goes through a situation involving uh, advice from their regional medical director that either follows this or the other chart that you just reviewed, and that school learns how to deal with that situation. If it's something else arises in the future, do they need to report that to the regional medical director or can they deal with the situation per the knowledge that they've gained from previous I, experience? I think you can start, you, you certainly don't have to wait until you hear back from the regional medical director. Use the knowledge that you've gained, but they still would like to be notified of it because they'll have a um, true pulse of what's going on across the entire region and not just on your individual campus. So again, we're early in the in return to in-person learning. At this time, the Office of Public Health and the nine regional medical director teams have asked that we continue to notify them for these symptomatic individuals and not just positive cases. We'll see how that workload changes over the fall semester and see if that's something that they still want to, um, want to be notified for. Okay, thank you. And we had another question come up around masks. Would you say if a mask is too difficult for a child to wear, uh, would wearing a face shield be better than nothing? Apparently teachers are noticing kids have their masks on, off, they're in around their mouth, they're on the floor, et cetera. Um, I think teachers are also struggling with masks as well. So if the alternative is not wearing a mask whatsoever, would a face shield be appropriate in that situation? All right, so let's bucket that um, into two separate categories for adults, you said teachers, but I'll say adults because there's plenty of edu the educator team who on the campus who are not teachers and also um, students. Um, and I see a question from D. Thompson. I'll get to that in a second. Um, the, you know, it's tough, the, a, fa a face shield or a, you know, does not replace a mask. That being said, might it confer some degree of protection as opposed to not wearing anything? Perhaps, and I suspect that it might. I think those are gonna need to be taken on an individual basis. Again, I hesitate to make an overarching recommendation because I fear that the interpretation might be that a face shield is an acceptable substitute for a cloth face mask, which it's not. That being said, I think we, we, all of us, myself included, spend a lot of time um, focusing on the, you know, 
small percentage of folks who it's challenging to sort of follow these recommendations as opposed to understanding that the vast majority of people on the campus will be able to follow these rules and recommendations. And I don't want people to spend a lot of time trying to police the onesies and twosies who, uh, for whatever reason, can't effectively wear the, wear the cloth face mask. I think as I've seen um, in the individual um, schools and school systems deal with educators who have challenges wearing cloth face masks, I think those have been discussions that they've undertaken to understand better what the um, aversion is to that and if it's something that's a discomfort and what other opportunities are to effectively protect that team member and all the folks that they'll come into contact with. I, I haven't heard that a lot of educators have not wanted to wear the uh, cloth face mask, but that they have trouble wearing them effectively and all the time. And I'm gonna just do a little bit of instruction here since I talked with Dr. Welch before this. This is right, this is not right. And I think, I know we all know that conceptually, but the tendency during the course of a school day or a work day is to get a little bit lax with how we do this. I think the other place that educators need to be acutely aware of a time to keep it, you know, really wear that face mask is when students aren't around. And we've seen several sort of mini clusters when it's been educators or team members, not in the presence of students who haven't been adhering to social distancing and mask wearing and have caused a couple of mini clusters across the state. So I think educating the teams about that is going to be incredibly helpful. Okay, as far as uh, the recent question that just popped up that you just referenced, Dr. Finger, um, can you go back on when it's appropriate to accept a doctor's note and when it's not? Yeah, I see that. So I, I think, you know, perhaps this is different in each of the different regions, but we have not, man, you can't force someone to get a COVID-19 test, which is why we've allowed some oversight by the medical professionals to be able to determine whether or not a child does not have COVID. Um, I think if a child has a history of asthma and they have respiratory symptoms consistent with asthma and they get a breathing treatment, we have allowed that. So I will clarify, I, I'm reading the question from B. Thompson. Um, uh, our discussions have been like that they can get that doctor's note. I will tell you thus, thus far, the vast majority of providers are erring on the side of caution when there are symptoms that are truly concerning for COVID-19. So uh, I'd be interested to hear if that's just locally in the greater metropolitan New Orleans area, or if that's not similar to what you guys are seeing across the state. But thus far, by and large, we have not seen a lot of people who have been saying, I don't need to get tested. I've got a doctor's note here, so. Okay, and if there's a positive test result, then that individual needs to go through the necessary uh, quarantine regardless, correct? Yeah, there is, there, I, I don't know, I see another comment I'd be interested, are, is D. Thompson saying with a positive test that some medical directors are allowing them back to school earlier than the 10 days? Because that is certainly not the recommendation from the office at CDC, our Louisiana Office of Public Health, or me at this time. We had another uh, question come in that says, I want to be sure if I understand Dr. Finger's response relative to the fact that if a test was not recommended by a doctor that we should allow them back with a note rather than following the no test performed route. Yeah, and I, I think to be, to be clear, I think this is someone, let's say, I, I think maybe we need to change the wording on the no test performed. That would be a, you come to see me, Dr. Finger, I say, I'm recommending that you get a test because you have all these things that could be consistent with COVID-19. If there's no test capacity in the local community or for whatever reason that family does not wanna get a test, that's a child or team member I would put on this um, pathway. So perhaps we need, need to change that wording because just the fact that a test is not performed, I might see a student, a third grader who had the child I described with the asthma, I'll determine they don't need a test and I'll write a note saying their symptoms are not consistent with COVID-19. 
So perhaps thank you for pointing out that question. And I'm glad I just see from V. Thompson, it's doctors, not medical directors. So uh, I don't get intimidated by doctors who are trying to um, decrease the duration of the isolation period if there's someone with a positive test. That, that has not changed. And actually, last month, we decreased that duration from 14 days to 10 days, but it has not changed in the last month. I'll just make a reminder to everyone that's on the town hall, this chart is posted on the Children's Hospital website. If you look at the bottom right hand corner on this slide at our school wellness uh, website, you can look this up. We have it available there. So we'll be sure to keep it updated and you can download that at any time. So we'd encourage you to check that out there. Additionally, me, this PowerPoint slide. Answer, Kimberly, the question from Georgia about the household member um, who cannot effectively isolate themselves. You know, I think that's something that is going to be dynamic. Again, the regional medical director's team is just going to make the recommendation. If, if they can't effectively isolate, here's how you do the countdown, 10 days plus the 14 days. Again, we can't police that. Um, and I think it's going to be hard if there's a doctor's note that's saying it's okay to return. I, they certainly can't come back before 14 days, if that makes sense. It's going to be very hard to independently police the 10 days plus 14 days. So if they say that they can effectively isolate, I think at some point in time, we need to trust our community that they're a part of this solution and not create barriers to them returning to school. Can you also elaborate on whether you can actually test out of quarantine or not? So you had yep. a positive test and then got a second. Yep. You, negative. You, you cannot test out of quarantine. So if you, if you go to that second algorithm, Kimberly, if you're defined as a close contact, you're in quarantine for a period of two weeks, period, end of story. What's going to happen, again, let's say now it's not me on Monday who gets sick, but that Johnny is a third grader who is at school. He's been fine. And at 11 o'clock, he gets a fever of 103 and a sore throat. So you guys would say, hey, he meets symptoms. Let's get him out of the class. We I get him home. He goes, he sees his doctor. He gets a COVID test. And on Tuesday, you guys find out it's positive. So school nurse or school representative is going to call the regional medical director and say, hey, Johnny was here on Monday. He's in third grade. He came in, he was fine and developed symptoms. He's positive now. What the answer from the regional medical director's office is going to be is say, okay, tell me how Johnny's classroom is set up. Who sits to the north of him, the south of him, the west and the east? Are those six feet apart? If they're six feet apart, they'll say, great. If they're one feet apart, they'll say, well, those four kids are close contacts. Boom, move out. Tell us also how Johnny moved through the morning. How did he walk? Were there any other periods where he was sitting close and next to people? And that, that's how they'll use the schools and your information into help determining who's a close contact. Now, keep in mind, the regional medical directors will have the ability and the authority to say, well, if we can't get good and accurate information, we'll err on the side of caution and determine that more people are actually close contacts than might have been. So if a school says, I have no idea where Johnny sat or anything like that, then they might say, well, we're just going to call the whole class a close contact if they can't get accurate information. Um, that being said, I've already seen um, an increased ability for schools who call the nine regional medical director offices across the state to have better information and understanding when they make those calls and have worked with the regional medical director teams to help delineate that better now than even we were two to three weeks ago when the first schools returned to in-person education. In that process, Dr. Finger, is it possible to keep student information confidential or is there a way to assess the situation without providing student information? Well, so you guys know every positive COVID test in the entire state is reported to the Office of Public Health. So it's private, but we can all the Office of Public Health has access to all that information. So I think you, they probably don't necessarily need to know that it's Johnny Jones, but they'll need, they'd like to know that it's a third grader who sits in a class of 18 people, the deaths are spaced like this, et cetera. Okay, thank you. And then we have a scenario question came up about um, parents that 
have that were suspected to have COVID themselves. They went and got a rapid test. The rapid test was negative. And now the school is concerned about allowing the students to come back. And the school is concerned that those parents might have been tested too soon and that maybe those children are still in a situation where they might be exposed. How do you suggest handling that? And then maybe we can elaborate on how to handle other parent symptoms and things like that. Yeah, so I, that's a nice question, Kimberly. I think for the scenario that you just described, we have to trust the information that we get. And, you know, we here in at Children's Hospital in the greater metropolitan area, I think test results, the sensitivity, are much different now than they were in the month of March where no one knew about the accuracy. The tests are pretty accurate, and I think we can trust them, and we need to trust them, or else essentially at periods of time, half of the country would be under quarantine. Um, I think we have to trust the negative test results that we're getting for over 94% of the people in the state of Louisiana at this time. We have to trust those. That being said, if there's a parent who is sick on a Friday and has a test pending, and that test is still pending on Monday morning, I might hesitate sending your child to school until that test result is is positive, especially if your child has any symptoms at all, because there's a true chance that, that if that is positive, your child will be a close contact. So I think be cognizant of that. And if there's you know two kids who are sick in the house, probably sending the third kid to school until those two children get evaluated is probably imprudent. We can't make that as a hard and fast rule, but I think there is gonna need to be some common sense that our families use. Thank you. I, just, I was mentioning earlier, I just want to remind everyone to visit our school wellness website. On that website, we have a copy of these charts. We have recorded town halls. We're going to post the PowerPoint slides. I think those are also available on the Department of Education site. We also have a, a helpful link section that can take you to places like AAP, Department of Education, or the CDC guidelines. But most specifically, there's a map of the regional medical director's coverage and their contact information. And we're working to keep that updated, and that's the information that our hotline references as well. So please uh, steer yourself to that website to find uh, guidance materials like that. You know, Kimberly, I'm just reviewing V. Thompson's question again. I think the question related to can people accept a doctor's note to decrease the duration of the isolation or the quarantine, and I hope I reiterated that's not the case. I will clarify whether or not a doctor can write a note saying that this is not COVID-19. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that's what me and the State Office of Public Health Leadership team agreed upon, but I've been on a million webinars and allow me the opportunity to verify that. So I think it's a slightly different question than I initially under, understood it to be from B. Thompson. Okay. All right, I think we can move on to the next slide, Dr. Finger. We don't have any more questions coming in at the time being. Okay, so I'm happy to provide a little elaboration on this slide. This is really just a reminder to everyone about how to leverage Children's Hospital resources, specifically the hotline and the website. So um, the hotline is available to you Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Saturday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can call this number anytime you have a question about an individual um, that has maybe COVID-19 symptoms or you're concerned. If there's anything in your question or that discussion that then grows into a larger assessment around determining close contacts or, or even reporting positive cases, we'll be able to direct you in the right direction, uh, direct, point you in the right direction to contact your regional medical director. Uh, we, do work, we collaborate with the Office of Public Health, so we like to stay up to date on the best way to communicate with them, and we can advise you on that at that point in time. Say there was an example where a school nurse was calling this hotline about a child at school and the school nurse was aware of the fact that the child did not have a primary care provider and needed to see a physician and the parents would be interested in doing a virtual visit with one of our Chinola physicians. Uh, we're more than happy to arrange that, but that would be a situation where parent consent would be required. So all you would need to do is make sure that that child is put into the isolation room and is picked up by their parents and during that pickup, just please encourage the parents to call this hotline and they can access their resources anytime the parent is available. 
This also applies to return to school screening because that's also an interaction with the physician, as well as enrolling a patient in at-home symptom monitoring. So those are the resources available through the hotline. Um, if you have any questions about that, please let us know. Anything regarding a physician visit will just uh, take place as normal billing, and there is also a cash price for anybody that doesn't have insurance. So um, we're well prepared to address a variety of needs that come up on the hotline. And uh, the staff that's manning that hotline are well-trained nurses that, ha that are, uh, have a large expertise in this area. They've been manning the hotline through um, since the COVID-19 pandemic here in New Orleans and have a, a broad history in case management as well. I know I just outlined some ways to leverage the resources on our website, but just for the sake of reiteration, all of our recorded town halls are there. I will also make sure that our um, slide decks are available as well. Um, but please feel free to download the materials that are also available for you. We've made sure to include high resolution files, um, such as informational flyers for parents uh, or flyers you might wanna keep around the school, as well as campage signage that you can then use your own printing resources for, like floor stickers or table tents or reminders to socially distance. And then of course, we'll have the COVID-19 decision tree that we keep up to date um, on this website as well. We most recently launched an FAQ submission, so it's an open uh, form. You can type in your question and we ensure a 24-hour response time. Uh, we are also in communication with the Department of Education's uh, dynamic FAQ documents, so content from those questions will be posted publicly as well. And anytime you have questions about trying to access our virtual care resources, that is available all through our website also. And if you have any feedback for, um, on navigating these resources, please feel free to reach out to our school wellness email address. That's school-wellness at lcmchealth.org. So that's just a reminder on some of our resources and we'll go ahead and open it back up for additional questions that have come in. I've seen a few. I see one, what about removing all students from a room with symptoms? So I think, um, I think what the question asks is, if Johnny is symptomatic and you remove him to the isolation room, what do you do with the other students? Right, right away, you, you know, the most important thing is removing the child. Um, Kimberly, I, I know you've been on a lot of the calls with Dr. Gonzalez about how to address that. And I think the mo that's the most important thing, correct? Removing the child. Is there anything that needs to happen immediately for those other students? Uh, whenever you're putting the student in the isolation room, no, you yeah. just need to identify the child with symptoms and wait until you have further information before you address situation involving other people. Unless those, those children have symptoms as well. But then, you know, uh, Dr. Finger, do you want to elaborate on how to manage a situation where you might need to put more than one person in an isolation room? Sure. I think, you know, um, if you do need to do that, the biggest thing to do is effectively, if it keep a mask on the child or the team member, if it's a team member who can't immediately leave campus, and just make sure that they can remain six feet apart while in the room waiting for a parent or another family member to come and pick them up from school. We had another question come in that's uh, is back to parents. If a parent is very concerned about their child's health, should they report to the hospital without calling? I might ask for additional clarification around that. A a a absolutely. I think if they're concerned about their child's health w without, you know, when the kid is at home off campus, this is from someone anonymous. So I'm not sure. Obviously, if it's a um, medical emergency, the schools and the nurses will behave as if this, as they would have done before March of 2020, where if it's a medical emergency on the campus, I anticipate that the local um, emergency authorities will be called and the child or team member will be bought, brought to the local um, hospital or wherever that designated location is. I'm unclear if the question that popped up in the Q&A is if it's someone that's at home, yeah, and they're concerned, they can certainly, if it's after hours, either go through their primary care provider or go to their local emergency facility to seek medical evaluation and treatment, absolutely. And if that's not the question, please could you clarify whoever submitted it? Thank you. And if you ran into a situation where there were concerning symptoms that maybe the person that was calling our hotline might not have been aware of, the nurses on the other end of the hotline would be able to guide that individual at that time as well. Absolutely. 
So I'll go ahead and copy and paste the website into our chat here in just a moment as well for all of you to reference. If we go back to uh, our chart on the bottom right hand corner of this slide uh, is our website www.chinola.org slash community slash school wellness. Thanks, Kimberly. Dr. Finger, should we jump into just a little more elaboration on how to advise parents when they should keep their kids home from school? I know there's been a lot of advice around how to keep an eye on your child's symptoms, but what if a, a parent is sick? Should they send their kid to school when they themselves feel like they're having symptoms? Yeah, I think it depends, uh, you know, like everything in the age of a global pandemic, and there's not, unfortunately, a one answer fits all. I think if there's an adult in the house that works outside of the house, has had lots of community contact in an area where there is disease prevalence that's high, which is everywhere, you know, higher than zero, uh, excuse me, um, and that adult has symptoms that could be consistent with COVID, um, you know, they should think twice about just saying, yes, I'm gonna drop my kid off at school. Now, that being said, it's more, more likely that another child in the house has symptoms. I think kids get sick more frequently than adults. And that's where you have to think, should I just keep both kids out until I can get the first kid evaluated? I think that's dealer's choice. There's not a right answer or a wrong answer. What I will tell you, the wrong answer is if there's someone in the house who has a test pending to set either, or a kid who has a test pending or a team member has a test pending, that person cannot return to school until that test is resulted as negative. So that's an important thing. We've also seen a couple of breaches where people didn't understand that while the test was pending, um, that they were to remain off campus as well. I think that's the bigger breach we've seen so far. Okay, and then uh, circling back on the question that we just mentioned about um, removing a student from a class full of stu other students that might have symptoms, and then we put that student into the isolation room. Uh, when would we need to know, or when would we know that we would have to then clean the classroom and allow it to sit for 24 hours? So at this point in time, that recommendation is when there's a documented positive case, or alternatively, if you um, call the regional medical director team and based on the information that you give them in real time, that they feel like the entire classroom should be cleaned. Okay. And so then you would remove the entire classroom first, leave it 24 hours and then walk in and clean it, correct? Well, the, what, we, what we've been advising people to make it operationally something that you can implement is that you clear, to clear out the classroom at whatever time of day it is, and then the next morning before kids come to campus, clean it and allow them back in because that way it takes sort of the time of day that the classroom is cleared out of picture and allows it just to be sort of shut down for one day. But those are decisions that you'll make in conjunction with your medical director. Okay, great, thank you. A couple other questions come in. If a student's test is pending, any close contacts can continue to come to school, correct? Yes. That is, absolute, that is absolutely correct. And then when the student does test positive, then those students would be informed and quarantined. That, that is correct. And if they develop symptoms, then you would result to the symptomatic chart that we reviewed. Yes. How would, uh, the only time I might, this is for Andrea, I might keep that close contact out of school is if it's a sibling um, and there's a high suspicion that the initial student has COVID-19. That might be the only time because then that sibling's two-week period starts a few days earlier, if that makes sense. Other, but those are, those are decisions that you discuss in a one-to-one -one conversation. The next question is, how would you already have a positive case? You don't already have a positive case. You remove Johnny from the classroom. Um, and, in so, and again, we're looking towards the future where we might have an expansion in capacity of rapid or same day testing results that across the state. I, I know that's not today, where we might know that Johnny, that third grader I mentioned to you before, he got symptomatic at 11 o'clock and we find out at one o'clock that he's positive. We can clear the classroom at that time and then clean it the next morning. 
Okay, great, thank you. So we're getting down to the last seven minutes of the hour that we have scheduled. I would encourage everyone to continue to put their questions in the chat so we can make use of the time that we have left. Dr. Finger, do you wanna talk a little bit about the types of tests that are available and what the difference is between them? Um, it's probably not pertinent necessarily because I think there's a lot of variability across the entire state of Louisiana. The overarching point that I would make is in the early phases of this pandemic, particularly the first three to six weeks, there was a large number of tests available many of which weren't validated and people, uh, individual clinicians and hospitals had a lot of doubt about. Those tests that were not adequately vetted have essentially been wiped out from the market. So all the tests that are now available are valid and sensitive and specific, meaning uh, can detect almost all of the cases that are positive and won't detect cases that are negative. That being said, when you use the phrase rapid test, there's several types of tests that can give you answers or a result on the same day. Some of those tests give a result within 15 to 30 minutes, some within two hours, some within four to eight hours, and some that require a special instrument to run on. If you're in a hospital where they have that instrument, it might be same day. If it's sent somewhere else, it takes up to anywhere from 24 to 48 hours up till still in some locations in the state five to 10 days to get those results back. So I think there's just wide variability depending on exactly what location you're at and where you get that sample obtained. And maybe we can also spend some time talking about how the disease is actually transmitted. We, because of um, its relation to moisture and um, uh, droplets that are communicated when talking, there's been a lot of confusion around sweating and other bodily fluids and things like that. Um, can you clarify some of that please? It's close contact from respiratory droplet, droplets only. So, you know, you, it, you have to be within three to six feet in order to get that um, contact. Otherwise, those droplets dissipate in the general atmosphere. So again, when you're outside and socially distanced, you're, you're not gonna catch this disease from someone. It's in that incredibly close contact for someone who has the disease, even if they're asymptomatic, and they're breathing on you for an extended period of time. So sweat or things like urine or anything like that. What Again, I'm giving you the information as we understand this disease on September 1st, 2020, that is not thought to be a mode of transmission. Okay. What if a student like vomited on another student? Would that be more concerning because that was near saliva? Um, I guess that's not something I'm going to promote as a activity of daily living in the school. Um, but no, at, for what we understand now, that's not going to put that child um, or team member at increased risk. Okay. Thank you. And we continue to get questions around the difference between isolation and quarantine. I know that we touched on this with the charts that we just reviewed, but maybe we can hit on that one more time. Sure, so isolation is for an individual who has tested positive. What that means if you're gonna isolate in your own house is trying to have zero contact with anyone else, not even like going into the same room with them. And if possible, to designate for the period of your isolation, your own designated restroom in your, in your own house, okay? that's isolation. Like it means not going for a walk or anything like that. If you're on quarantine, it's slightly, slightly less stringent and it means that you're close contact. It, you very likely don't have any symptoms and are frequently completely asymptomatic for those two weeks. You can, if there's a household of people that is on quarantine, they can co-mingle together, okay? They don't all have to stay apart from each other. And that quarantine period starts and extends for two weeks. And the day one is from the date of your last close contact with the symptomatic individual. Thank you. And we have a good question that came up about when to tell the difference between identifying a student that needs to go home and instead just identifying somebody you need to keep an eye on. Apparently before COVID, there was, you know, whenever there were situations coming up with kids, they had either a headache or a stomach ache or respiratory symptoms, they would just take note and send them back to class. 
um, but not necessarily sent home, but now that's changed. So are there any fine lines that you can recommend to help aid those judgment calls? Yeah, I'm going to guess that question comes from a school nurse who mm -hmm. our school nurse community really is going to be on the front line. This is from Burner B. You know, there the the CDC has come out with some clinical criteria, i.e. if you meet if you have two of these and or one of these, then they consider COVID if you don't have another diagnosis that is more likely. In pediatric patients in particular with viral fraud, there's almost always something that is more likely even in the age of uh, COVID-19. In the greater metropolitan area, we have other viruses that are far more common even now than COVID-19. So the caveat is you can always suspect something else. I think that question right there from Berner B is the reason that the regional medical directors at this point in time want to remain in close dialogue to get a sense of the true symptomatology and frequency with pediatric complaints that the frontline team members at these schools are facing. In that situation, and this will be our last question, in that situation that we're just exploring right now, who would be the first organization that that nurse should call? Should they call their regional medical director or should they call the children's hotline? So at this point in time, the, the local region one medical director in for region one has said, you can call the children's hotline and we will take that information, answer it and route it back to the regional one medical director. The other regions would prefer that that call goes directly to their team. If they're unable to get back to you in a timely fashion, then call our hotline. And again, I'm being intentionally nebulous here because everyone is working and being pulled in a thousand different directions. They want to be able, the regional medical director teams absolutely want to be able to be responsive, but knowing that the depth of their staff is limited, so they don't want someone waiting on the phone for an hour or two while you need an answer. Okay, thank you. All right, if anybody else has any other questions, please free, feel free to leverage the FAQ portal submission on our website or send an email to the LDOE and we'll make sure that information gets back to you and is posted on um, the dynamic FAQ document that we're all contributing to. Uh, Dr. Finger, do you have any final thoughts before I close? I think we just uh, took this picture um, from 1918, the last true worldwide global pandemic, which was not COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, but actually the influenza, schools were able to return in many cities to in-person education, particularly Chicago, New York, primarily because their operations at those schools bought into the fact that they were going to do the right thing. And I think school nurses and school educators led this effort and work diligently to identify anyone who was sick. And I think they were able to do that in two, the two largest cities in the United States in the face of a pandemic because they had engaged educational leadership. And I think Dr. Brumley and Ken and the entire Department of Education has put together an operational game plan that's challenging, understanding that everyone, not just on this phone call, but across the state is gonna do their best. I think with that in mind, I know that we can do this successfully. You pretty much said it. All right, thank you everyone. Please again, reference our website for a recording of this and let us know if you have any questions or feedback. Uh, we appreciate everything that you're doing and uh, it's our honor to support you right now. Have a good day.